Hey guys and gals, I'm Palad. Welcome back to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Today is a special episode. Today is an unconventional episode. Normally, I've saved Korok Seed Collection until the end of the video. It usually got in the way, it was a detour, and it interrupted the pace or flow of an episode where we had to spend 45 seconds getting a seed. Especially when I'm commentating something. I have to focus on getting the seed, and I have to process that while still not losing track of what I'm trying to say. And so, I would save these until the end. But this time, they're not getting in the way of what I'm trying to do, because Korok Seeds are what I'm trying to do this episode. If you look at this map, every leaf icon on the map and every colored beacon is a Korok Seed. And if I zoom out, and if you were to pause the video, you would see that there are exactly 33 of these icons on the map right now. And that's because if I warp in place, you'll see that of all 900 seeds in the game, I am only missing 33. I have 867. And so those markers on the map are the final about the final session of Korok Seed Collection that I need to do for this Let's Play. Thus, it, they're going to be the focus. Normally, I cut between them. This time, I'm only going to be cutting between them if, if there's an extreme gap in time between when I am go collecting, uh, say, that one and the next one. And I'm going to be commentating this. This is going to be the episode. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. It's not going to take longer than a normal... Um, than a normal episode. Future Pal will do a, do a good job at cutting around there, but it's it's definitely going to be the episode. This is our focus because it has sp it has taken up so much of my time. In a typical recording session, I about half of it, about half of the entire session, there it is, is spent collecting Korok seeds. Typically, for two or three episodes, I record for four, maybe five hours. And two and a half of those hours are Korok Seeds. That's right. Two and a half hours. So, this episode, we're going to be doing that. And also, while we're doing this, I think this is a good opportunity. Uh, let's, let's ride our horse there. I think this is a good opportunity for me to talk about some things that... Some opinions that I've, I've held back throughout the series. Uh... I don't actually know if this will kill my horse. I've never been brave enough to try it, but I feel like in this episode, I will, you know, I feel like I'm on top of the world. Does this kill my horse? Yes, it does. Uh, Agra, are you alive? Okay, she's alive. Well, the, that was not something I expected to happen. Okay, I was hoping the, the thing would save me there. But, uh, what was I saying? I'm sorry, Fox. You really should have used Shine. There's a one frame of invulnerability. Use it, man. That's that's actually kind of dumb. That I have to get off my horse. But yeah, I, I can say I can. I think it's time for me to share some opinions that I've I've held back a little bit throughout the this series. And it, it's weird for me to admit that because, to a certain extent, this being a blind let's play, that's the allure of it. The allure is me having some blind reactions, but when those blind reactions are negative uh, right off the bat, I typically have kept them to myself, because that defeats the purpose of a Let's Play. A Let's Play is supposed to be a game that the person enjoys. Unless it's a montage thing, you never want to feel like the person playing it doesn't enjoy the game that they're Let's Playing, because then you don't feel like you should be enjoying it. And so, like I said, some of those reactions I have, I have reserved. And so, I, uh, things like the Korok Seeds, whether or not it's a good mechanic. On the tin, I think it's a great mechanic. I think it's fantastic. It's like, uh, when, uh, for those of you who, um, who are savvy in the Let's Play community, Proton John Let's Played, uh, Yoshi's Island. The original Yoshi's Island. And what he found was that when you're playing the game just for fun, it's a blast. But when you're having to 100% it, th it falls apart a little bit. See... I knew there was going to be something when I started playing through this game. I knew there was going to be something that was going to irk me about this game. And I'm, that was clearly it. I had completely forgotten about that. The one-shot red coins. 
just completely ruin a great game. But that's only for going 100%. If you're not going 100%, you probably don't care. Your enjoyment is severed, because certain things are just not fair. Like red coins. And I think that similar thing is with Zelda. If you're if you're wondering why I just I was able to run right to this rock is because this particular seat I've already done because I've repeated intros due to nervous nerves. Oh rock, no come back. And I think this game has that mechan that uh, feeling as well. Quark seeds feel great if you are trying to simply expand your inventory. There are double the amount needed to do that. You only need 450 to to expand your inventory, and you can see I currently have. 428, so by the end of this, I'll have 450 sitting in my inventory, and it feels great. But then, when you're trying to 100% it, I think it actually doesn't feel that bad regardless, because they are indeed everywhere. Now, lo looking at them on the map is a pain. Before this episode started, I actually had to pull up a map, a completed map, um, made by the Zelda community that had every single Korok seed on it, and I had to cross-reference it with every single seed I had. I had to look at the entirety of the map, sweeping it inch by inch, comparing each thing individually. Where's... Th oh, there it is. S getting each thing individually. Let's see if I can do this one stretch. There it is. Can I do it? Steer. There it is. Got it. Woo! Tony Hawk! Oh, I got it. Ah! Oh, I missed it. Oh, it's a shame. And so 100%ing it, I think, is a bit of a chore. But overall, I've, I've thought that it was... Was it a good experience? You can tell that this particular part of my opinion is still not entirely formed. And I don't expect it to be fully formed until I complete the whole thing, because... I'm still a little bit excited at being able to record after this without preluding it with, with a two-hour recording session. And all in all, I don't think I'm the correct person to ask. I, I'm strange in that I, I enjoy collectathons for some reason. I, I, maybe it was, actually, I, I think it was Pikmin. I think I have concluded that it was Pikmin that gave me this, this enjoyment of grinding in video games. But I just, I like it. I like playing the same character over and over in a video game. I like doing all these, I like plotting out every single square in Animal Crossing. Is that good? No, it's not. It's not a good thing in video games, but it's, it's something I enjoy. Pikmin has put a very deep-rooted enjoyment for that inside me. And so overall, I think it's a, a slightly, it's a good mechanic because it's never, requ it's not required, it's completely optional. I don't even know what the reward is for completing it, but it's probably not good enough to merit wanting to 100% the Korok Seed category. I hope it's good. I hope it's not just a, a sealed envelope type thing or the classified envelope because that was really lame. And it's lame, but I guess it wasn't, like, a hard thing to do. It just required a ton of money. But this is actually hard. And so I hope that whatever the reward is, it's something like, oh, you can now insta-kill people. Something crazy nuts. Uh, let's see if we can do this. Normally for these ones, I throw, I throw it onto an ice block. Can I get it? Yes, perfect. Other things I've kind of kept myself were just the general dungeon layout of the game, because I have come to the opinion where... Just pick that up. This, wait, this is a weird Korok seed. I'm not exactly sure what to do here. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. I was thinking it, it had something to do with the bow, but no, it does not. And that one is here. Like, the, the mechanics of the dungeons, I think... Let, let me put it this way. I was thinking about the replayability of Breath of the Wild. How how eager would I be to completely replay the game? And my my verdict was not very likely. I mean, I would want to plink around. Uh, I've already done that. I've gone straight to the uh, final boss from getting off of the Great Plateau and fought him with with nothing but like terrible weapons and shield bashes and. That's cool, but replaying the entire game, I've come to the conclusion that it's it's not very good if you are if you have already 100% of the game. 
It's just... It's not. Because the shrines are are mechanics that you've seen before. You know how to solve them. They're just really quick quick one-on-one-off -on -one -off puzzles. And that's it. And that's it. You can vi revisit the memories again, but you could just look those up on YouTube and be cool. It's not... It's not like you're experiencing them again. There's no good lead-up where you'd say, Oh, I really want to see that. I can't just look up the cutscene. That, that doesn't do it justice. Especially since the story, in essence, is optional. You don't need to do the story. Um. Oh, no. Um. Oh, I desperately hope. Oh, that... A sinking, a sinking feeling just entered my stomach. Are there... Are there two here? Oh, I hope that there are two on this island. If there aren't... I, oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, I started sweating there. Oh, the... I've, I've looked over the entire map at least twice, maybe three times, and... Oh, the pit in my stomach from thinking that I maybe missed one. Oh, okay. And so I've come to the conclusion that it's just not replayable. And the reason being, whenever I think of what I want to see when I'm considering replaying a Zelda game, whenever I'm considering playing through uh, Skyward Sword or Twilight Princess again, it's usually, it's, it's actually always one of two things. Maybe three, depending on it. Um, it's either... It's either, oh, I want to see, um, I want to see the story again, because the story was really good. I like Toilet Princess's story. It just resonated with me. There are some good themes. It's very dark. Um, or, uh, or it's the, the dungeons. It's the dungeons for me, or just the overall theming of the game. Ugh. This. It just, I, I want to experience, um, this dungeon again. For, for me, it's, uh, Snow Peak. Snow Peak is a dungeon that I, uh, okay, I'm not just gonna play this thing's game. Ugh. Come on. Come to me. Snow Peak is a dungeon that I've always loved. It's functional, it means something. Each of the rooms are are for a certain a certain function, whether or not they're kitchens or the chapel or the uh, the armory. Uh, they all serve a realistic purpose and they're just it just happens to be a dungeon. It's not supposed to be a dungeon. There are a lot of enemies there. Or um Let's see. The pirate ship. The pirate ship is also a great dungeon from... Not not from Wind Waker, but from... Skyward Sword. Yeah, I couldn't think of the name. Wow. <laughs> One of my favorite Zelda games. From Skyward Sword. It's a great dungeon. It feels great. They're, the time mechanics are fantastic. And it works the bow in an interesting way. And has some cool enemies to boot. And I look forward to playing that. But here in Breath of the Wild, the dungeons aren't themed. I mean, you can try and make an argument that they're themed. You can really do your best. And to be fair, I can't say that the Divine Beasts aren't themed. I mean, the the Fire Divine Beast, Varudania, he does have aspects of fire in the dungeon. Varuda. Or, uh... Ma no, not Mado. Yeah, it's Varuda. Varuda also does. Varuda has water in there. Neat. But the framework, the skeleton that those water mechanics are... <laughs> are built off of does not it does not have water mechanics it doesn't show the uh the famous ruta or um zora craftsmanship it doesn't feel like a zora dungeon and if you were to take it out and put it on its own no one would really complain it just looks like a dungeon that's it <laughs> am i really riding a deer over there come on deer my trusty steed come on Come on. No. Don't just walk. There you go. Good job, dear. And whenever I, I look to play Wind Waker, I think, oh, I get to play through the Earth Temple again. I love that dungeon. It's so cool. And you don't get that with Breath of the Wild. And uh, I think I, I can hit it home here. Man. No. No. Stop falling. Nova, my, my sister. She's been on the channel before. She, at a, past a certain point, stopped... Wait, this isn't the seed? Oh. She stopped playing... She stopped doing the shrines. And in fact, 
Uh, she, while she has completed the game, she hasn't, she hasn't gotten all the shrines, and she is not, oh, this, this is uh, really annoying. That was an annoying one. She's, so she stopped playing through all of the, the shrines, just because they, they got repetitive. They're, yes, they're a cool mechanics. They're, their mechanics are never repetitive. But the design of the shrines, the, the layout of them, what the, the setting of them is repetitive. It's just the same thing. Instead of seeing a great amalgamation of different culture, in, uh, different fictional cultures, you see one culture, an ancient culture, which you don't even get to experience in the game other than that. Just their handiwork. Instead of having a flavorful function where it's like, oh, this is meant to, you know, be a, a, wor a place of worship to this particular thing. It's, no, this is just to test you. And here's the kicker in my eyes. Here's the kicker that really makes me dislike the design of the dungeons in this area, in this game. This game is based around the fall of Hyrule. Hyrule, it's not just Ganon took over, it's Ganon took over a hundred years ago, and the entire place is now just a giant wild land. It's a giant, it's a giant lawless place. But, every single dungeon in the game, except the last one, except Hyrule Castle itself, doesn't reflect that because they're not in ruins at all. In fact, they're brand spanking new, which is not something that any, any Zelda game has had. No, not a single, a single place has been like, oh, this place this was just, just built. This thing is so cool. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And that's upsetting. The entire thematic of the game is just torn apart by itself. Oh, look at that little Lionel over there. Aww, he died in three hits from me. You know what would have been cool? What would have been really sweet? And I just thought of it the other day. Actually, I thought of it today. When I was when I was t thinking about what I was going to talk about during this Korok Seed se session. Section? 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 What would have been great is... Because this game is a culmination of every timeline in Zelda. That has been confirmed. Is that a chest? What's in there? Ooh. And it's something that I have long suspected considering the names of some of the areas here. Here it is. That's been confirmed on the Japanese Zelda website. In fact, one of the viewers made me aware of that. And like I said, I've already long suspected that this is the culmination of all the timelines, but that supports it. And that bearing in mind, and considering that we've seen the ruins of certain locations from particularly Skyward Sword, it would have been great if the dungeons were not original, but instead remixes, old remixes of previous dungeons that have fallen into ruin, some, fall some walls have caved in revealing new areas, and just get some unique spins on pre-existing dungeons and remix them, because this is also to celebrate uh, Zelda's 30th anniversary, right? I think. I think this is five. Yeah, this was five years after uh, Breath, uh, after uh, Skyward Sword. So it would have been so cool. But they didn't. Instead, we get all these spank uh, brand spanking clean shrines that don't have a, a resonating theme with them beyond Sheikah. And not even Sheikah that we've really seen before. It's just like, oh, the Sheikah, yeah, they're they're really cool. They're established. They They have technology. And then that's it. It would have been so cool if they had remixed dungeons, and it would have been a great throwback. But instead, we got Divine Beasts, which are very loosely themed. Loosely themed in, in the vein that it's like, oh, water. Oh, fire. Oh, air. <laughs> I believe that Aang can save the world. Like, the... the the air, last airbender avatar dungeons are not good. They're great dungeons. They're very well designed, but they're not 
pro they don't give you a sense of oh man I I would ex I would play this game again just to have another crack at that dungeon because that was so fun and so cool looking that's not the sense that you got at least it's not the sense that I got playing this game and it's I I've probably meant it kind of some of my distaste for that has come through my commentary especially in um the the was it the Thunder one? I think it was in the Gerudo one, because I got really frustrated with one of the puzzles. And normally when I get frustrated with the puzzle, at least I have the aesthetics to fall back on. It can look cool. Where did that thing go? And so I think that there was just some squandered potential there. Uh, and, and also some of my reactions that I... I can't believe I'm still on this topic. Hopefully uh, Future Pal can edit this together. There it is. Some of my, my blind reactions have been... They've overshot their mark a little bit. Originally, when I started playing this game, I was actually upset that Ganon was in it. I was, and to be fair, I don't like Ganon in Zelda games anymore. Because he's just been done to death. And he's a, a really annoying plot device, because it's basically an excuse for the writers of the story to say, Hey! We don't have to write a new villain. We don't have to explain his motivations. It's just Ganon. I find that to be disparaging. And I like it when the the team flexes their their genius and writes a new villain. Gurahim is my favorite villain in the franchise. Not just because I mean I have a weird like fanboy thing for for uh, Gurahim. He's just a really cool enemy in my opinion but also hopefully this guy doesn't attack me doesn't look like he cares okay he seemed a lot more vigilant when I whenever I first saw him Gurham is a really cool enemy because he has a motivation he's everything that fee is not the the two uh, juxtapose each other very well he's new he's something the series has not seen before he is a a person who is serving another person not for his own self selfish gains, because he's actually just a servant. He's literally a servant. And he feels like the main bad guy for the entire time, so you wonder, oh, what could he be reviving? My word. And he doesn't make any presumptions that it's the Gurham show. He's, he is, he is cocky, but he's trying to serve his master, just like Fee is trying to serve you. And in the end, he even takes his, he takes his lumps from Demise without any... Any question? He's like, oh, yep, I'm a sword now. You know, this was part of the plan. In the very end of the game, there is a plot point that I'm not even sure if it was expanded upon because it's so weird. Gurahim at one point abandons Demise. At the very end, Demise's sword disappears, which the sword is Gurahim. And Demise looks upset. Demise looks a little bit angry there. Uh, warping there. Demise looks a little bit surprised in that moment, too. Like, he didn't expect it was possible for his sword to disappear. And so it's theorized, mainly by me. Uh, I, have a, I have a Word document actually writing down what I believe the story of Zelda to be. Uh, I wrote it down back in the Skyward Sword. Oh, I'm going to have to wait on this, won't I? Wait, what? You can hit that away? Oh. Well, neat. Onward with my story. I, uh, it is my personal theory that Gurham escape or leaves Demise, abandons Demise, not it's because he's betraying him, but because in his eyes, he can serve his master by serving the incarnations of Demise that are to come. And my opinion, my idea with that is that I, I really fell off of talking, uh, critiquing Breath of the Wild. I'm now talking about this. Um, by serving in the ba in the um, in the background, and so in a lot of Zelda games, or in just the the Zelda the Zelda overarching story, there are there is quite a lot of talk about interlopers. The interlopers that we hear about in Toilet Princess are actually um, the the people of Termina, believe it or not. Majora's Mask is also the Fused Shadows from... Um, if you look at the Fused, shadow, fused Shadows in Toilet Princess, the eyes of which are actually Majora's Mask's eyes. 
that is Majora's Mask. As well as uh, the Hero's Shade being Link, uh, it's, it's very, very heavily suggested that Link fell to, or is struggling, with the power inside the Fierce Deity Mask, and that's what turned him into a Shade. Also, he was turned into a Stalfos by uh, the Lost Woods, because if you're not a Kokiri, being in the Lost Woods turns you into that. That is also confirmed. And so there's this overarching storyline of, uh, you see it in the Shadow Temple in Ocarina of Time. The Shadow Temple is, um, it's, it talks about it being the chronicle of, of Hyrule's bloody and greedy history. And um, also when Link was born in that game, it, he was a refugee fleeing from, or his mother was a refugee fleeing from uh, the carnage of this war within Hyrule and possibly another another nation. Now in Termina, in Majora's Mask, we discover that the, the people of the Stone Tower had found a power <clears throat> found a power that was rivaling the goddesses and they were using that to try and and ascend to the sacred realm, kill the goddesses, and they were they were blaspheming essentially against Hyrule's power. And thus they were sealed away. Does it sound familiar? Well it probably should, because this is legit that's legit the story of the um the Twilight in Twilight Princess. Where is this? There it is. So there's a, there's a lot of talk of interlopers uh, in this game. It is kind of insinuated, innu, insinu, in, innuendoed, no, <laughs> insinuated that the Yiga clan are uh, the the remnants of just a, a an interfering force in Zelda. It's not necessarily the Twilai or the Twilai people, but it is an interfering force, which is very resonant. Uh, we're taking a left. An interfering force in the uh, the world of Hyrule that is outside of Ganon. Um, there's also it also explains a lot of questions of how does Ganon keep escaping his his seals every single time. You could argue that it's just because Ganon is Ganon and try to force of power and whatnot. But remember that he's usually sealed with the power of the Triforce of Courage and Wisdom. So. It's just weird that he keeps escaping, and in my opinion, the Gurahim Lives theory, or the Gurahim Lives On theory, really explains a lot in how Ganon is continually able to escape, how there's this this consistent evil force in Hyrule that's completely unrelated to Ganon half the time. It, it really is. Like, the, the Twilight people being sealed away, that has nothing to do with Ganon. Majora's Mask is a game that I would love to play on the channel because... It is such a a lore intensive game. I have never played it, which is weird for me to say because it is my favorite Zelda game. I have never played it, and it's been because it became my favorite Zelda game after I started Let's Play, which means that I've been waiting this entire time to Let's Play it. I know everything about the game, but I have yet to play it for myself because I, I want to save thoughts that I might have spontaneity DB. I don't know how to say that. Uh, born out of spontaneity? There, that's better. Where is this thing? Oh, it's right there. Uh, time scale. Yeah. So my favorite's probably Skyward Sword individually, but the lore of Ocarina of Time, of Majora's Mask, of Toilet Princess is just too con... con Continuity, con continuous, continuous to ignore. It's the Z the Zelda trilogy that was planned out. They link into each other very well, and the the stories are 100% related. Whereas other Zelda games, they feel like if you look at the timeline, they're just kind of there. They their stories aren't meant. Their stories are meant to stand alone, which is not which is not a great thing when you have a a series as long as this one. You want things to tie together. You want people who are into the series to be rewarded for their memory for playing the other Zelda games. And you only really get that with 
the main trilogy of, of those games. And so, that's... And also, I guess I, I just love Majora's Mask because it doesn't feature Ganon. It does not feature Zelda. Zelda's only in it once in a flashback. Hopefully that doesn't spoil it. And it's it's so lore-intensive that you have to appreciate it. It's not one you can just play through and not pay attention to the story. The story matters quite a bit. The game is the story. And I guess that also wraps right back around into why I think that Breath of the Wild doesn't have much replayability. It's a fantastic game, don't get me wrong. I am quote-unquote hating on it, but that doesn't mean I don't love it. It doesn't mean that it's probably not going to be end up being one of my favorite games of all time. But... When it comes to Zelda games, I think my original statement in Episode 3 was very accurate where I said, this is not Zelda. It's not. Is it great? Yes. Does it tie some things together? And actually, it, it works very well in, because this is the, re the uh, reunion of the timelines, it's easier to write for now. And it can tie in things from everything instead of Nintendo having to keep what's canon for the timeline straight. So I'm excited for that. But I hope going forward that they keep these mechanics, keep the mechanics of the combat. The combat's great. I, I love I love everything as I bow spin, which is not intended. Uh, I thought that was a cork seed. Oh, there it is. Hello. But I do hope that they go back to the old story uh, or the the story mechanics. Uh, I ditched the the linear linearness of uh, the previous Zelda games like they did in this one. But then overall, um, make it so. There's a theme, and music, and good antagonists. Rivali's Gale is now ready. Okay, uh, with ten Korok seeds remaining, I think that it's it's high time that I started talking about them. <laughs> because I've been rambling on about the story and about all these different things. I would like to reflect on Quark Seeds a little bit. And less about reflecting on what they are, and mainly about how they get them, because I've been doing this a lot. This has taken up... Where is this? Oh, it's probably in the pond, isn't it? Oh, there it is! So yeah, whenever, whenever I'm looking for Quark Seeds, I have found that... While I do use the mask, I use the mask a lot. It's gr it's a fantastic way to zero in on a Korok seed. Usually, you can spot them regardless, based on based on your surroundings, really. And what I found the best way to look for Korok seeds are look for trees. Trees are such a huge indicator of of where a seed is at. It's actually crazy. Like th that particular one. It it was a ring of rocks surrounded, or, or a ring of rocks with a tree in the center. A lot of them are atop trees, and, and you might say their rocks are probably a better indicator, but let me tell you this. Half of the Korok seeds in the game, probably about half, they're in trees, and the one and a lot of them that are under rocks are actually in trees as well because the rocks are on top of the trees. Oh, there it is. Speaking of trees, booyah. So yeah, half the rocks that are half the Koroks that are under rocks are also in trees. There are uh, there are pots that can be hanging down from trees that have Korok seeds in them. There can be pots that are embedded in trees that you can get Korok seeds from them. There are trees that you can shoot fruit out to get Korok seeds from them. They are literally in trees everywhere. I think there's one right over here as well that was in a stump. And so yeah, they could be inside stumps. Hello! Goodbye! Hello! Uh, actually, I'm gonna wait until I get on the mat because it's gonna be... It's gonna be so hard to get out of this river after this. There we go. Shoot that! Booyah! Seven! Editing Korok Seeds is such a drag. Basically what I do, in case you're not involved with the process, is say I found a Korok Seed right there. I find it, I, I discover how to get it, because some of them are a bit com convoluted, and then when I'm ready, I go, timestamp pal, and I zoom in, wait for the map to focus and zoom out, or depending on if I started close, I, I just say timestamp pal, and zoom out. So let's do it with this one, actually. Where is this? There it is, okay. 
I, I make sure that I can get it within the first few seconds. So like this, and then I go, time step, pal. I zoom in, and then I grab it. And that's it. That's all I do. But most of them have a few minutes of startup time, of, of setup, and that one was a little bit easy because I, I can just run up and do it. Oh, hi. Hi, little Pebbit. Hi, Pebbit. Oh, you got hurt. I think if I shield bash, you die. Okay, not quite. Well, if I do this, you die. But that that whole rigmarole of having to record for two hours and then also edit it and, and listen for timestamp pal or just recognize it in the waveform, I also do that, is such a drag. I, I have to sit around for hours editing these. Or I guess it's like an hour. It's, it's kind of, it's a conversion time of like... Half an hour to every two hours, essentially. But that's still... Or 45 minutes to every two hours. I think that's a better conversion. And that's just a drag. That's a huge drag to have to do. And it makes it so when I start record or start editing the episode, I'm already exhausted from, from doing this because it's it's time-intensive work and it's also mentally draining. Just have, I have to do that, that wind every time. And so it's going to be such a pleasure... To not have to do that anymore. To just get right down to the brass tacks, look at my timeline, see, oh, two, uh, two, uh, two episodes? Oh, it's just, you know, it's two hours. That's just going to be so nice, and I, I, I look forward to it. But yeah, I, I don't mean to say that it's been a drag, because it hasn't. I've enjoyed doing Korok Seeds. I think that the street cred of it will be kind of kind of crazy, because this is, like I said last episode, this is the biggest collectathon I remember in a Zelda game. It, it really is. Or actually, in a video game. I can't think of a bigger collectathon. So I, I do like the fact that I'll be able to say, oh yeah, I did this. I I conquered this. There. Okay. There's the stone. But I will say that the editing time is crazy. Especially uh man, uh okay. I'm gonna just jump. And actually. Daruk. Perfect. That's my. F that's the only good thing about Druk's protection is that it blocks fall damage. It, it's gonna free up my life a lot too, just in real life. So, in case you skip the episode, which is easy to do, uh, I I have a girlfriend. Um, it's actually my first girlfriend ever, which is brave of me to admit. But I have a girlfriend, right? And it stinks. <laughs> On Sunday afternoons, after we ju after we got out of church together, and we already went to lunch with our friends, uh, we usually go to a restaurant every every Sunday. To have to say no, I can't come over to your house and watch Avatar: The Last Airbender. I got to edit Korok seeds, because <laughs> that's the thing that happens. This is an interesting pattern. I feel like if you trace the lines of this, this would be visually appealing. And boosh. It, it just, it's not fun to say, to see that disappointment in her in her face. And so I'm, I'm happy to be rid of that. Uh, I'm happy that it, it just means that my Sunday afternoons are going to be more free. Because I just, it, this particularly editing Korok Seeds is not something I really enjoy. Because it's not something where I can flex my skill. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun to get into the rigmarole, the, the grind of it. But past that, where is this particular one? It's not that great. This one's in a tree, I believe. It has to be, right? It has to be in this tree. This tree is unique. So, yeah, it's going to be in the tree. Yep. What I what I tell you? Look for trees, guys. If you're looking at home for Korok seeds, unique trees, just looking for unique trees will get you to Korok seeds faster than anything else. Wait a minute. Okay, let's not let's not count our chickens before they're hatched. Let's go get this one. And then recheck, because I I'm getting a bit paranoid. There it is. I am getting a bit paranoid about this. Because I feel like there's one missing. Oh wait, 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 wait. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like there's There's something missing here. We got this one, we got this one, we got that one. One, two, three, four. I thought my count was right. Oh, let's let's warp here. I I think that I'm missing something. One moment. 
Is this the last Korok seed? I'm getting I'm getting paranoid, guys. I'm getting real paranoid. Four ninety nine or eight ninety nine? Okay, okay, that's cool. Uh, oh, <sighs> okay. I I was a bit worried there. I thought. Looking at the count of Korok seeds in my inventory, I thought that we didn't have enough. We didn't have all of them, but that was a bad thing to do. This is indeed the final Korok seed of the game. Whew. This is it. This is the end. This is the end to all of it. I mean, not the let's play. Uh, the, the, that end will be a, probably a bit more emotional. But this is the end of the Korok seeds. This is the last Korok seed. In the entire game of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It's right there. It's right there. This is obviously a secret. I'm supposed to dive into that. So, run. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, it's a Korok. It's a Korok. Yaha, you found me. Huh? You're not haste, do. It's right down there. We have 899. Man, how many of these guys are in the game? It seems like wherever I look, there's another Korok. And I have so many emotions getting this. Relief? Excitement? A little bit of sadness because I think I will miss this. I think I will. Getting, sitting down and recording this, I'll realize that I have done this. Excitement for the reward? Slight disappointment about the reward because I don't think it's going to be that good. So many emotions are are mixed together and are surging inside me. That's not the cork seed. <laughs> it's down here. This is it. Let's savor this vista because this is the vista that the end slate will be on. Can you believe it? The end slate will... that That's hitting me more than anything. This end slate will not be Korok seeds. It will be... This. Korok. And you guys have told me. I have found out how many of these things are in the game. And I have no hope of 100%ing that. Because there are... F not 500... Not 100, but there are a thousand of these things, or uh, 900 in the game, which is bonkers. Let's get it. Let's get it. I'm ready. I'm ready. No more, no more fooling around. I have 899 Korok seeds. Get out of here. Now, I have. As I, I have to do this physically. This is a physical action I have to do of lowering the controller. Literally setting down the controller as I set down the need to get any more seeds. Yahaha! Ha! You found me! Korok seed. This small seed was given to you by a Korok. It has a distinct smell. If you gather a bunch of them, you never know what may happen. Bye bye you found all of the hidden Koroks. You should tell Heistu the good news. I was wondering if the game would have some sort of little fanfare for that. Tweehee! That's it! 900! 900 Korok seeds! We're warping a Heistu, man. This is gonna be the end of the episode right here. Let's warp. Let's find out what this is. All I know is that it's called Hastu's Blessing. That's all I know. I accidentally saw that a few episodes ago when I looked up the uh, the classified envelope. I saw Hastu's Blessing flash on screen. That's it. That's all I saw. And just as a reminder, the lore of these Korok seeds is that all of Hastu's brothers and sisters stole the seeds from his maracas that gave him his power, and they have been hiding with those seeds. So every one of these seeds goes inside of his maraca. Each one we can assume has eight uh, has 450 seeds inside of it. Uh, let's I, I always like playing dress up in Breath of the Wild. So let's let's do just that here. Boom. And 
Boom. There we go. That looks cool. And we still have our triple potion. Before we talk to Hastu, let's go to the map. Oh! Whoa! I did not- I have not been paying attention to that throughout the entire episode. The percentage completion jumped from, what, 96% to the- at the beginning of this episode to 99.51%. We have 0.49% remaining in the entirety of the game. That's nuts. da dee da Hi, hey, Stu. I bet your maracas are mighty full. Uh, actually, they're probably not full because I have like 400 and whatever in my inventory. Hey, Stu. Hey! Guess what? All the forest children return to the Korok Forest. You must have had an army of people searching for them, huh? No. It's been just me. No way. <laughs> nice! You've maxed out all your stashes, so let me give you this. Hey, Stu's gift. Uh, a gift of friendship given to you by Hey, Stu. It smells pretty bad. Poop. He gave us poop. Okay, <laughs> so, do you like it? No, I don't. I hope you'll still visit me. You can watch me dance whenever you want. Shalaka! Can we actually? Shalaka! If you have Hastu's gift, dance with me! What dance shall we do? Weapon stash? Dance party! <laughs> Are there different dances for each weapon thing? Okay, that's that. We're getting a nice sweat here. Okay, then bye bye. Wait. Are there different dances? I've never noticed that. Bow stash. Dance party! Oh, there are! There are different colors, too! It's the same dance, it looks like. Just different colors? Huh. Uh, you know what? Just for sake of completion. Shield stash. Blue. I wonder why blue is always associated with defense. Blue bubbles! Yeah! Shalakai! That felt great! Mm okay, then. Bye bye We're pausing. That's it. Shake. Hestu's. Shaku's? Hestu's gift. It smells pretty bad. They literally give you feces for beating this. That. That's the most insulting thing to me. That is the most insulting thing. <laughs> because it's not like, oh, here you go. Here's a. Here is a medal of honor. It's like, yeah, here you go. We're going to give you literal feces. Not even, like, the gift was was crap. Like, they're literally giving you feces for it. Well, what we see is what we get. Hastu's gift does literally nothing. And in fact, the only thing it does do is make you realize what Korok Seeds are. That's right. Korok Seeds have a distinct smell. <sighs> They're dropped by Koroks. And Hastu's gift is just a larger Korok seed. Congratulations, there are 901 Korok seeds in the game. One of them is given by Hastu. When you discover him, surprising him with all 900 seeds. And that's it. No, no reward, no slingshot, which is my hope. No, no maracas that we can beat people sense senseless with. The reward is literally nothing. Except for the street cred that came along the way. <sighs> you guys better appreciate it. And I appreciate you, actually. Because for the entire series, the entire thing, where I've talked about the possibility of me getting every Korok seed, I have asked time and time again, for you guys not to spoil it. Not to tell me what the reward was. And you haven't. You have not. Not once have you told me, or accidentally told me, and then and then other people marked it as spam, that the reward is, is garbage. You haven't told me the reward is good. You didn't even say that there was a reward. Because I asked you to. 
And that's that's a good that's a reward in my opinion. That's as good as a reward as I can ever get because that means my community is behind me. And that's gonna be it for this episode. <laughs> uh, still reeling a little bit from that. That's gonna be it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for being patient with me as I got all of these seeds, as I took so long to beat this series. The series isn't quite over yet. And in fact, next episode in Pal Plays Breath of the Wild, I will, first of all, not have to record for two hours to get Korok seeds. But secondly, we are going to be working on completing another shrine quest, the side quests, because I, I punched in every single side quest in the game. And also, uh, one of the commenters, I believe it was Airhead, Arhead, I'm still not sure how to pronounce your name, maybe you can help me with that, uh, did also post a list of stuff we hadn't completed. So I used those, and I extrapolated what I have not gotten. And it's a, a short list, as you can see, uh, on the right there. But we're going to be completing every other quest in the game. And then, we're going to Lanayru. We're doing the final trials, and then I believe we're doing the final final trials because I've been hinted at that. I've been hinted that that is what we're doing. Or that that is what's next. Whew! Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you have enjoyed this series. And join me next time in Pal Plays Breath of the Wild, where I think we might get 100%. See you guys then. I'm gonna be my own comment section for once. Heistu's gift is called Kin no Unko, which is the Japanese symbol for good luck. So by giving us this, they aren't just saying, oh, you know, skip you, you did this and you're bad for it. It's saying, you know what, you, get, you did a good thing. Good luck, from here on out. Thank you for playing our game. We've enjoyed making it. Even though the label is complete garbage and... <laughs> It looks like they just handed us a steaming pile of you-know-what. Now, what I would have liked the reward to be would have been, like, a, a, a secret code that the first ten people to get this would get some unlockable in the next Zelda game, or in Smash, or something. But, the developers saying, you know what? We, we are glad that you did this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for playing Breath of the Wild. That works, too. Huh?